From the police helicopter above Cyberdyne Systems, it's the IGN DigiGods. Please welcome two pilots who are about to get out. Wade Major and Mark Kaiser. What an awesome intro. Cyberdyne's always welcome. Corey? That was written by Elijah Lipschultz. I'm allowed to say it that way. I'm one of you. <laughs> we were just talking about the great American tradition of Jewish comedy. Yes, you know what? It, 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 it's a comedy based on, on the fact that uh, we're constantly hard on yourselves. Hard on ourselves. <laughs> yeah. That's the best way to put it. You know, I was reading a great interview with Woody Allen, which our, our friend Mark Sanderson had sent to me, where Woody just kind of goes on about how he's never made a great film and never will because he's too middle class and too lazy. And when people like Steven Spielberg and uh, Scorsese will work on a scene for hours and hours and hours, he just wants to go home and have dinner. He just wants to call it a day. He never goes, no, we need to get that scene till it's amazing. He says, I'm not a perfectionist. I'm just, it's middle class enough, and, uh, you know, it's good enough, and I, I just want to go home and have a walk with my wife and take the weekend off. And, and watch the Knicks? And watch the Knicks. He just he says, because movie making is not my end-all, be-all. The thing is... Of course it's his end-all, be-all. That's all he's, it's all he's he says done. It's a pleasurable occupation. You could do worse in life. Um, but I, it's fascinating. How much of the stuff do you think he really believes? And I think how he much believes is... it all. I think he really believes it all. He never goes back and sees any of his films once he's made them. He just enjoys making them. No, but does he realize that he is one of the great American masters no. of all time? No. 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 He, he, he doesn't – he looks at Kurosawa as, as great. He looks at like you know Bergman. David, David Lean and Bergman and these guys who just will sit there obsessively. He, was ta- he talked about how he's not crazy enough to be a great director. And it's – what I, the beauty of that I think is not just the humility and the self-deprecation of it, but the fact that it, it, once you become too aware of your own greatness and what it is that makes you great – that's when you cease to be great because then you sort of try to tap it. With him, it's just second nature. He's just doing what he does, and to him, he doesn't even realize that it's, it's just it's so instinctual with him, which is wonderful. It's, it's, he's, he's in a groove, and he just, you know, not every film is great, but good grief, he makes a movie a year. Well, that's why you wonder whether a a year. maybe if he made a movie every two years, each one would be better. Yeah. Match Point is the one that he thinks is his best. Ma- I have a feeling if you ask him that question tomorrow, he'll give you another movie. Honestly, y- yeah, he, m- he might. But you know what? If you look at Woody Allen's movies, I mean, certainly Manhattan is just a wondrous piece of work. But uh, the ones that I really think stand the test of time the best are the ones from that 80s period. Oh, yeah, Crimes and Misdemeanors. Husbands and Wives, kind of overlooked. Hannah and her sisters? Hannah and her sisters. Uh, and, and come on, let's give it up for Broadway Danny Rose yeah. and Zelig. Sure. Zelig. Star Wars? Zelig. Star Wars? You didn't do Star Wars? I think he did. Maybe he did. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, Marvel. Give him a film. Oh, Obi- Come on, Marvel. Give <laughs> Ob- him a film. Obi-Wan Bernstein. <laughs> oh, please, Marvel. Give him a film. Ant-Man 2. What, whoever you want. Luke, Luke Skywalker. Plastic shit. Man. We talked about Plastic Man last yes. week. Plastic Man. Give Woody Allen Plastic Man. That's right. Give Woody Allen Plastic Man. <laughs> Star Wars would have been great, wouldn't it? No. Well, would've it been... couldn't be any worse than, uh, than si- the last one. Si- si- Skywalker would have been great. See, you're taking it. And you're, I see, I'm uh, running with you it. Quit while you're behind. All right. So, uh, well, let's, let's... I have more food for you, by the way. Last, really, week, really? last week, guess what? You remember what I had last week for you? Uh, no. I had a four-layer red velvet cake Oh, that's for you. right. That's right. It was a really good layer cake. I gave it... What did I rate it? I rated it like a... Seven and a half. Seven and a half. Did Out I really? Out of ten, yes. I was in a very giving mood. You were. Well, okay. what, what, what I had this week is not as exciting, <laughs> okay. but uh, I actually, the only reason I'm, I'm letting you have it is because I made it like three weeks ago, and it's been in my freezer, and I want to get rid of them after... I want to well, get rid all of right. it. Shall I... So, do, you, do you want to go get it while I do a quick uh, lead off? Yes. Talk about something I wouldn't care about, like Kidvid crap. I will talk about. Oh, I'll go to the uh, MHZ line, and I have been I have been informed by the people at MHZ it is not megahertz networks, it is MHZ networks. So uh, that is MHZnetworks.com. I think it's just so that people go to the right website too. Um, anyway, MHZnetworks.com has another round of really, really great European uh, shows. They mine European television. They mine uh, the, the globe for great shows from uh, in foreign languages primarily. And uh, we've got Kabul Kitchen Season 1. Pretty courageous show. It takes place in Afghanistan w- during the, uh, the U.S. war there in 2005. It's a brownie. Ooh, yummy brownie. 
Uh, and uh, it's, it's, it's basically this place in Kabul in Afghanistan, which is like a, it's sort of like uh, Rick's in Casablanca, right? It's the, it's the pl- or, or Cheers. It's the place where everything uh, comes, to, comes together in the, uh, the capital of Afghanistan in Kabul. Um, anyway, it is, uh, and from there, you get into this really interesting uh, kind of Jack and, uh, not Jack, but Sam and Diane, Jack and Diane there, I've listened to too much John Mellencamp, uh, Sam and Diane kind of deal, where uh, this woman named Sophie, sudden, this aid worker, suddenly shows up, and they haven't seen each other for 20 years, uh, the guy who you know, runs the joint, and uh, it's interesting. It, 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 the, the directions that it goes, the way that it integrates all of the, uh, the political machinations that are going on in Afghanistan at the time, it is completely unhinged, it is really cool, and uh, it's just an, a completely unusual show. It's uh, like nothing I've ever seen, Kabul Kitchen uh, Season 1. And also, The Churchman, season one. Um, man, there are just so many really, really interesting, uh, interesting shows that they pick up. This is a, a fascinating drama about uh, five young men in Paris who are uh, entering the seminary and who all represent unbelievably they, – I mean, they're, they're not like nice kids. They're really – they, they all just come from completely different backgrounds, and it's about the chemistry uh, and the conflicts and the conflicts within themselves, and it's just it, it's it's completely fascinating, and uh, it's it's one of the few shows I've seen where uh, religion is not the point. It, religion is kind of the the backdrop, but it's really about these guys and their life struggles. It's just absolutely fascinating. Um, the legacy comes from the people who did The Killing and Borgen, and Borgen is, of course, absolutely great. Uh, this is a Danish show, and uh, it takes place in this, uh, this gigantic estate uh, just outside of Copenhagen, and it's um, kind of a, um, oh, I don't want to call this a Downton Abbey. I don't want to call this a Danish Downton Abbey because it's, because it's not what it is. It's, it's a, but it could easily be compared to that. It's uh it, it's a it's a it's a fascinating kind of family drama slash thriller, and uh, it's super stylish and really really well done, and uh, highly recommended. The Danes have some of the best talent in the world, especially relative to their uh, their population. The Annika Bengtsson crime reporter stuff is also first rate. These uh, this is this is really really good stuff. If you ever saw the movie Under the Sun by Colin Nutley. Um, Colin Nutley is an expat English director who's been working in Sweden for the better part of his life and uh, most of the time directing his wife, which he does again here, Elena Bergstrom. They, they made a film called Under the Sun, which was Oscar nominated and which is wonderful, and this is their, uh, this is their work on television together and it's really, really good. Great Swedish show, uh, basically a, a crime show, but it's based on some really good novels by Liza Marklund and it's very literate and extremely well acted and I gotta tell you, I don't know what she's taking, but um, you know, Elena Bergstrom has not aged in like 30 years. It's, it's sort of Horrifying. I, I, I think she made a deal with the devil or something. And then nine episodes of Maria Vern. Uh, you get episodes one through three on one disc, four through seven on another, and then eight and nine on another. Uh, these are really, really great uh, Swedish crime stories from this amazing series based on novels by Anna Janssen or Jansen, J A N two S S O N. Uh, a little bit more like what you would see on British television, but uh, really, really rock solid stuff. Very, very interesting. And uh, these are all two disc sets, and uh, first rate acting, first rate writing. So across the board, all this stuff is really good. MHZNetworks.com. Go check it out. Good stuff. Excuse me. Yes. So, Mark, what have you? Uh, what, am I supposed to eat this brownie? Yeah, it's the last one. Well, this is the last one. Well, You're I made it the... like three weeks ago, but uh, they've been in the freezer for three weeks. All right, fine. Well, I'll I want to get rid of them. All right. You Let's know what else I want to get rid of? What do you want to get rid of? Hot pursuit. Oh, no, this is like the female. Uh, no, it's uh, not. It's the r- female nothing. Midnight, it's a midnight run. Fem- midnight run. With you know, why is midnight run not on Blu-ray? Tell me I why. Don't know. I don't know because uh, Mar- Martin Brest has no career anymore. He's not. No one wants to do anything with him. <sighs> I don't know. This they can't tie it into the next Martin Brest <laughs> film. If he made another movie, they would. That is true. Although it is available uh, on import, there is a mm. midnight run import. By the way, is that brownie good? It's good. It's moist and a little salty, which I like. Oh, it's salty. It's good. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. A little hit of salt. Mm-hmm. Um, those brownies are good. The uh, the recipe was kind of a pain in the heavy. ass. Heavy, heavy. Yes, I like that. You have to eat, like Got you, some weight. You can't have a huge piece of it. That's oh, all I right. Could. <laughs> mm-hmm. 
There actually is an import Minette Run Blu-ray is available there? across the pond. Really? Not very good. I've mm-hmm. heard that the video transfer is pretty poor. Mm-hmm. But there's a bunch wow. of extras on it, which is good, but mm-hmm. video transfer poor. Anyway, Hot Pursuit is with uh, Reese Witherspoon and uh, Sophia Vergara. Wade, with that, you have now said goodbye to the mm-hmm. brownies that I made three weeks ago. Well, yummy. Probably longer, actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't know what to say. This thing is just desperate and unfunny, and I don't think Sophia Vergara is... I mean, I'm not saying she's not... She's a she's a TV. She's one of those women who's like, she's really good for TV. Adds a lot of spice and fun and crazy, you know, Lucille Ball esque wacky humor to a well, TV she's like show. Charo, she's the new Charo. But in a movie, I just I, I if just she don't. Were Twenty say years it. younger, I'd cast her in a biopic of Charo. <laughs> Seriously, I saw Charo in concert. Did you really? Did she do the guitar thing? I never told you that story. No. Oh, here you go. You ready? You saw <laughs> April in concert. So years. You a- saw I, April. So years ago, this friend of mine. Uh, <laughs> he's so going to regret telling no, me no. saying this. Okay. So years ago, mm-hmm. a friend of mine, uh, uh, I, I'm only saying he's gay because it's part of the story. Okay. Fine. friend of mine is gay. Yeah. He says to me, I have to go to Vegas for the weekend because I am casting a new reality show about celebrity impersonators. And so I'm being sent to Vegas. He says, you want to come with me? Because just like a second set of eyes, look, look at these people. He goes, you know, you don't have to work, but just, you know, I'll pay for the for the meals because I'm expensing everything and you just come with me, just come with me, just so I don't have to go by myself. So I'm saying, sure. So I go with him to Vegas and because he's gay, he really wants to see Charo. Because okay. that's what, I guess that gay people want to see Charo. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I had not heard that. I'm, I knew no, that. I didn't know that either. I knew, you know, obviously Judy Garland and Liza. I knew that. I, they're, they're, well, they, a, were, they were not available. They a, were not in a, Vegas that there's weekend. There's a pantheon of female yes. performances, per- performers who have a huge following in, among gay men. Yes. And it's, you know, Judy Garland and. and, and that's right. Turns her, out it's Charo. Her family. Charo, I did not know, was part of that pantheon. So, so there you go. So do I want to go see Charo? Or is it a mantheon? Or I don't know. A don't mate know. The, well, anyway. It's sort of pansexual because they're both sexes. Yeah. Anyway, so do I want to go see Charo? Of course not. But he's my friend. He wants to go. He's paying for everything, so I go. Well, I knew nothing about Charo other than Coochie Coochie going into this show. Mm-hmm. Right? So we get to the show, sit down. She makes a very funny joke about Coochie Coochie. She says, yeah. you make fun of Coochie Coochie, but Coochie Coochie made me tens of millions of dollars. And she's like, you know, yeah. God damn it. So then she takes out her guitar. And again, I knew nothing about Charo except for Coochie Coochie and being on the match game. That's all and I she knew. she killed it. She was un. Real. She was so good. Yeah. Our jaws dropped. Yeah. I mean, not like, oh, pretty good for a comedian or, oh, pretty good for a woman who I knew just nothing about. the best in, the, un- in history. Unbelievable. Yeah. I, we, uh, we were just yeah. floored. She's so good. At, she's such a great flamenco guitarist. You, you, know, you know the story of how she came to the United States, right? On a boat. No, no, no. Do you, not, do you not know the story? Wagon. <laughs> Skateboard. <laughs> no. No. You really, you really don't know the story. I do not. The whole underage thing. No, really? Oh my gosh! Are we about to take time out of the show to well, talk about we, how we, Charo came to the United we, we, States? We have to. No, no, we we have to. Uh, we we, we got to go to the. You know, this is this is like an amazing amazing story. No, she um, she was like fourteen, fifteen, something like that. Well, anyway, Xavier Cugat right. discovered her. Right. Right. And he married her when she was like 15 or something like that, completely underage. And he was like 60, right? Mm-hmm. And he brought her to the United States, but they lied about her age and, and lied and said she was 18 so that he wouldn't be arrested for statutory rape and, and violating, you know, endless amounts of, of uh, you know, molestation and all those laws. And, uh, he, that, and he made her a star here. But she was always younger than she actually claimed uh, because otherwise Cougat would have been arrested. So she's even older now. Was now well, was the record ever corrected? Now, no, she's I, she's seventy four now. Let me let me see if but I was can, the record ever corrected. I don't know that. I don't know. Uh, hang on, I'm just checking here. Let's see. She alt. Here we go. Her exact age has been disputed. This is from Wikipedia. Exact age has been disputed for many years. Official documents in her birthplace of Murcia, her original Spanish passport, and her naturalization papers say that her birth date is March thirteenth, nineteen forty one. After emigrating to the United States, she claimed that she was born in 1947, then changed it to 1949. She ultimately asserted in 1977 court hearing that her passport and naturalization papers were wrong and that her true birth date uh, was January 15, 1951. Her current IMDb entry indicates a birth date of January 15, 1945. So uh, she uh, has said in interviews her parents allowed her to falsify her age to appear older when marrying 66-year-old band leader Xavier Cugat in 1966. So um, there you go. There you have it. You know, so go figure. 
Go figure. Anyway. I, my, my understanding was she was 15 at the time. She was like hot 15. Pursuit. Hot yeah. Pursuit sucks. Hot Pursuit, okay. Uh, Madame Bovary has been done a number of times uh, on film. Uh, Claude Chabrol made one that was fairly lackluster and not that terribly interesting and uh, with Isabelle Huppert. And then the classic one, of course, is the Vincent Minnelli black and white film, which is just brilliant and wonderful and is ironically not in French, but yet still the one that is most faithful. This most recent one, uh, starring Mia Wasikowska, or Wasikowska, or Wasikowska, however you want to pronounce it, depending on how Polish you are. Um, I know people, Polish people I know will insist that you pronounce it correctly. Everyone else doesn't understand it, so uh, you know, do what you need to. But Sophie Barthez, who's a, a French filmmaker, directed this in English and co-wrote it, and it's essentially the same movie as the Claude Chabrol film. It's, it's pretty lackluster, and um, I mean, it's faithful, but it's just sort of dull and drab and just lies there. And uh, I, I'm a little tired of, of Mia Wasikowska being the, the sort of the go-to Jane Eyre, Madame Bovary. Everybody's well, she has that wispy, she has that wispy, willowy airy, look. willowy, corset-bound classic literature thing. But I, I get it. But I, she can't be them all. She can't play every last one of them. You know. So, so find someone else, please. There are plenty of great British and, and American actresses who could do this as well. Mia Wasikowska is, of course, Australian. But in any case, this is on Blu-ray from uh, Alchemy. And, uh, it, I mean, it's not, you're not going to hate it. It's not horrible. It's just sort of dull and just lies there. But there it is. That's the new Madame Bovary, also starring Reese Ifans as Ramiller, Logan Marshall Green, Henry Lloyd Hughes, and the always in everything Paul Giamatti. Paul Giamatti's in uh, Straight Outta Compton. Is he really? Yeah. <laughs> you know the first time I saw Paul Giamatti? It was probably the first time anybody saw Paul Giamatti. At the Whole Foods. Private on... Parts. Private Parts. Yeah. The film. Playing Pink He was Muhammad. amazing. He was great. And you just go, who is this guy? He's incredible. He like, looks like kind of like a, looks like a rodent sometimes. And his eyes bug out, and he's, he's holding his own against Howard Stern, and he's amazing. He's got all this energy. Who is this guy? Turns great. out, there you Paul go. Giamatti. Paul Giamatti. Uh, Unfriended is one of those, uh, it's a found footagey thing from the producer of Purge and uh, Ouija. Uh, the fact that it was called Unfriended turned me off immediately because it's one of those, oh, uh, if we call it Unfriended, then all the kids will go see it because they'll think it's about them and Facebook and, oh, it speaks their language. So um, all that, all that uh, 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 predetermined prejudice aside, um, the film isn't terrible. It's not terrible. It's kind of engrossing. Yeah. There are clever moments to it. It's got a couple good scares that aren't, you know, aren't like, you know, boo, pop out of the closet type scares. So... You know, I have to say that uh, I would like to see this um, uh, director, um, Leo, whatever his name is, I can't pronounce it right, <laughs> uh, like to see him do something else besides this kind of crap, but I have to say that uh, I was expecting a lot worse with Unfriended, and it turns out that I got uh, a pretty decent, okay, acceptable kind of B-movie-ish, you know, ghost story, so... You know, and it also speaks out against cyberbullying, and that's a good thing. All right. There good you go. Deal. Unfriended. Nice. If unfriended. you must. Good. I, I hear it's interestingly shot. That's what I've heard. Well, it's all on computers. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. Very cinematic, that. Uh, Alan Rickman uh, stars in, or co-stars in, co-wrote, and uh, directed A Little Chaos, and it's good. Uh, this film did not get an awful lot of love. I don't know why. It, it, I thought it should have. I mean, it's a, it's a totally respectable film, really well made. The idea here, it's, a, it's kind, kind of a, a, a period Renaissance-era feminist uh, homage. And it stars Kate Winslet as the, uh, this amazing landscape designer who is responsible for um, basically designing and building the gardens in the court of King Louis XIV, played by Alan Rickman. And, uh, it, you know, she, of course, to be a woman in the court of King Henry the Fourteenth, and to do that kind of a man's job required a woman of unbelievable skill and politics and, uh, and bravado and all that stuff. And uh, it's great. And, of course, it, uh, it has to have a romance, and the romance has to be our guy of the moment, who is in everything as the guy of the moment, uh, Bel uh, Belgian actor Matthias Schoenertz. He's like the guy now. Oh, my God. You're kidding? Belgian actor Matthias Schoenitz? Yes, you I, know, the, the, the bullhead dude. Oh, yeah. Belgian actress M Matthias Schoenitz. He's in everything. Oh, my, he's, I, 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 I like that movie, Everything. It was a good movie. Yeah. Okay. He's in everything. He is. He's you like mean, the, wait, Bel you mean Belgian actor Matthias like, Schoenitz is in everything? Well, no one can pronounce his name, but he's, the, he's in everything. You know it. He's, in the, he's the new guy. He's the go-to guy. He's the, he'll be a Bond villain like the next the James Bond. Villain. He will, won't he? After Idris Elba's name is the next James Bond, he'll be the new Bond villain. 
gosh. It's like if you're if you're if you're an actor who can speak English and you have an accent, you will be a Bond villain. You will. That's it. That's all there is to it. <laughs> it's just how it goes. Uh, and then there's on DVD is Blackbird. Uh, which is, you know, Monique has been uh, allegedly blackballed. You know this, right? Yes. Because of her, her, her behavior after winning an Oscar or something. No, because she, she wouldn't play the game or something like that. Well, no, well, there, there was, was a story about how she wouldn't play the game during Oscar time. She you wouldn't know, do she, the right interviews. She wouldn't do she the right interviews. She wouldn't lobby. She wouldn't play she the gracious, yeah. magnanimous Oscar baiting, uh, you know. Yeah. She didn't. She didn't sort of toe the line or whatever. Correct. Well, you know what? She won an Oscar. What do you offer? And she deserved uh, it. I hate to she, say that. God, it's did. crazy she to think great. that she was great in the movie. She's fantastic. Well, anyway, she gets some work. She got some work in this, along with somebody else who's been a pariah from time to time, Isaiah Washington, who I think is also a great actor. Um, this is an interesting film with an in, in, in another young actor in this who's really good, Julian Walker. The film is Blackbird, directed by uh, Patrick Ian Polk. Who I've also never heard of, but who's also very, very good. Uh, anyway, Julian Walker is uh, is this kid. Uh, he play, Isaiah Washington plays his father, and uh, Monique plays his mom, and uh, so they're basically supporting this kid, Julian Walker, who is uh, who just radiates in this film, and who's got a real future ahead of him. Um, he's just this really, really solid kid who's just trying to deal with really inclement uh, circumstances in his life, uh, especially his his mom, Monique. She's completely unhinged. And uh, he's just he's just trying to hang on. He's just trying to hold it all together. And it's a uh, it's a it's a great kind of a, a an interior coming of age film, uh, very very sensitively written and extremely well acted. And I say, look out for this kid, uh, Julian Walker. He's got a real future. Wait, do you know who else has a real future? Yeah, Tom Hardy. I know, right? Fla. He's the man. Gla. Totally the man. I love him. He is just the best. I can watch that guy. He's become one of my all-time favorites. I just think that guy is just mm -hmm. so powerful, so riveting, so intense. He's great. He even makes a movie like Child 44 seem almost watchable. Bad. Yeah, you know what it is? It's just it's this weird like relic of the Cold War where, you know, uh, um, uh, Hardy and Gary Oldman and Numi Rapace, they play the Russians. Turn, you know, uh, Hardy plays this Soviet policeman who's his friend's son is found dead, and so he thinks his bosses are covering it up, so they demote him and send him out to Siberia to some you know small little outpost as punishment for questioning his superiors. And then it turns out maybe there's a serial killer um, on the loose. So, you know, I, I guess it just seems like it's... Um, everybody's got Russian accents, which is weird. The movie's kind of gloomy. It doesn't necessarily really come together as a... Um, as a mystery, not really that captivating, you know, it just feels kind of like a slog, um, it's kind of, you know, yeah. I mean, it's kind of well shot, you know, it's got that kind of gray, Soviet, atmospheric kind of cinematography, which I guess is kind of nice, but, um, you know, by the time it gets going as a thriller, it just, it just, it's just too late, it just really feels like a, like a, almost, you know, it almost feels like a, like an episode of a Cinemax show or something, like a, mm -hmm. some cable drama, so I, I would, I would, been. I, well, it was it was well, it was a novel to begin with. I'm sure the novel was terrific, at least good enough to make a movie out of it. But um, I would pass on Child 44 unless you love Tom Hardy, which I do. But uh, and also Gary Oldman. I also love Gary Oldman. Who doesn't? Uh, I love Gary Oldman uh, more as he's gotten older. So Northman, a Viking saga. Wouldn't that be funny if it were called Northman, a hillbilly saga? That'd be Southman. No, but I mean, wouldn't that be funny to throw people Northman? A Roman saga. Northman, a Chinese saga. What else is it going to be other than the Viking saga? Are you kidding me? Well, you, well they want, well, just, be, just in case. The thing is, it's not even a saga. You know, sagas are like those, the, the ancient Norse literature where it's sort of like the Iliad and the Odyssey. They're epic. They, things happen. This isn't is, is a saga. All these things that call themselves sagas. This is part of that whole new kind of uh, what I call um, pre apocalyptic. They're all basically post-apocalyptic movies, but they're all set in a medieval past, and there's a ton of these, and they all go straight to video. This thing actually had a little bit of theatrical play a few weeks ago, and as cheesy and, and poorly acted and ridiculous as it is, I, it's, it's, it's still fun. It's just a lot of burly, sweaty guys swinging axes and swords and just running people through, 
And the idea is very simple. There's a bunch of Vikings who uh, get shipwrecked on the coast of Scotland and wind up having to war with uh, Scottish tribes in order to make their way to safety across the land. And along the way, they take the, you know, the king's daughter captive, and then the king realizes that he has, to have, he has to then kill his own daughter or else they'll use her as hostage bait. I don't really understand the logic of that, but it's to show them that he's the man and that they can't get a, even if they have his daughter, he will kill his own daughter to, to kill them. Anyway, it's just a lot of it's it's basically a lot of uh, pseudo Shakespearean dialogue and then a lot of hacking and uh, that kind of an interlude over and over and over. Written by a couple of guys who are from Austria, directed by uh, Claudio Fa, who's from uh, uh, Switzerland. So these guys really don't have a firm grasp of what English should necessarily sound like, what it's spoken. But you know what? It's fine um, it, for what it is. It's just it's perfectly passable. It is a genre film in every conceivable way, and it's it's. You know, it's it's competently pieced together. It's got horses and you know good good effects and the whole deal. So even if it just feels kind of second or third tier, it's not going to bore you. It it's got its moments. Oh uh, wait, here we go. Uh, it's time for barely lethal. Barely lethal. Yeah. This is a, a bit of a misfire um, from the guy who directed Fanboys, which was also a bit of a misfire. And it stars Haley Steinfeld. And by the way, I have to put it on record that I am glad Haley Steinfeld is kind of carving out a career for herself. I am too. Because I loved her so much in True I Grit. I, I was so happy she was um, nominated for an Oscar. She held her own against uh, Jeff Bridges. She's in, she's in a bit of an awkward phase because she's growing up. And, and uh, I'm glad she got Pitch Perfect too, even though she's kind of not right in the role. But um, she's, she's going to be she's gonna be great. I mean, she's going to sort of settle into her her adult persona very, very soon, and she's going to be great at it. That is the hope. Well, until then, we have Barely Lethal, in which she plays a, a special ops agent who is tired of being a teenage special ops agent, so she fakes her own death, and she enrolls in a, an American high school. And Oh, my God, if you think being an international spy is treacherous, try going to high school. Not impressed. <laughs> Well, let's just say if you're of a certain demographic, you might find it uh, moderately uh, chuckle-worthy. But, uh, you know, I just got to say that um, this thing was not that funny. I don't know why Sam Jackson is in this movie. I feel like sometimes that guy will do anything. He almost looks like he's playing a spinoff of his uh, Kingsman character. Either that or he's lost a lot of weight. Yeah. I don't know right. what the deal is. But uh, so it's not quite good enough to be like a huge, you know, insane gonzo action movie. You know, it's not smart enough to be like a like a Mean Girls type, you know, like a postmodern teen movie. It's a little kind of like in the middle. So I wish it had been either a little more distinctive stylistically. It's a little bit too middle of the road. But, uh, you know, I, I guess if you're all done with your mean girls and yeah. Heathers and teen mm -hmm. comedies, you can go for it. But uh, ultimately, barely lethal, not that great. All right. So a couple of, we're going to do some docs right now. Uh, a couple of interesting docs here. Um, uh, this is from Benjamin Statler. It's called Soaked in Bleach, a documentary film about the death of Kurt Cobain. Uh, I, I, I don't quite know what to make of this because obviously I am not I, – I'd love to get sort of some, some alternate views on this. This is very much one-sided. But it's, uh, this is looking into the death of Kurt Cobain through the, uh, the investigation of Tom Grant. And Tom Grant is this uh, former detective uh, who was hired by Courtney Love to try to find Kurt Cobain, and basically this just had, and then just a few days later he, you know, turned up dead in what everyone has always believed was a suicide. Um, anyway, so the 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 thing here is this gets into you know all kinds of questions and and retraces and recreations of that particular fateful week, and um, it it. it tries to it, it certainly seems to suggest in many ways that there is, may have been more to his death no, than no, there was no 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 here's here's the problem yeah there is a very small very rabid very conspiracy misguided theory, yeah. yes there's a guy in Seattle named Richard Lee yeah and Richard Lee mm -hmm. is the main conspiracy theorist saying that Kurt Cobain was murdered, murdered. And either it was a comment, it, d depending on, what the mo on his moment, it's, it's either Courtney Love, it's either the U.S. government, this guy's out of his mind. Yeah. So there is this weird little subsection of people who think he was well, murdered. this certainly, this, this is, I mean, the guy was, is the detective and who put all this stuff together. So, I mean, this is actually, there, there seems to be a, 
there seems to be a it's like it's not just conspiracy. There certainly is evidence that points to it. But again, I'd love to hear somebody else from the other side go, "No, this is not." You know, I, th- there is another story to this. It's, There's a flip it's, side to the story. It's that case means. closed. Look. Anyway, if you want to see a better Kurt it's Cobain documentary, go see Montage of Heck. Okay. Montage of Heck is the cradle to graveish, you know, Kurt Cobain documentary. This stuff. Well, let me tell you what else. Let me go to the next doc, because this is terrific. Uh, I Am Big Bird, the Carol Spinney story. Big Bird! Uh, a few years ago, four years ago, we had Being Elmo, the documentary about uh, Kevin Clash and his rise to greatness as the voice of Elmo, right before he crashed with all of those, those, <laughs> those sex abuse allegations, which was so unfortunate. Um, but uh, interviewed in that doc was Carol Spinney, who, has, who is basically the only guy who's ever been Big Bird. He has an understudy who's been doing Big Bird for the last, you know, decade or so as well but it's still basically carol spinney and what an amazing story this is because spinney is he's sort of the the anti-puppeteer of the original uh, the original puppeteering you know pioneers of uh, of the muppets and sesame street he is uh, he's not like jim henson and frank oz who even talks about in the film as being larger than life and really energetic and he was like the introvert but he's the guy that basically created Big Bird and gave him life, and, and it's amazing when you see how Big Bird actually works. It's a whole. It's like being in a submarine, like a one-man submarine. All the stuff inside to make the mouth go and the arms and the whole thing. There's like a hole in a monitor. There's all this junk inside Big Bird, and it's not. And it's it's like Big Bird ate a man, and then the man now makes Big Bird talk. Uh, but what a great doc this is! Uh, for for like almost fifty years, Carol Spinney has has been Big Bird, and it's a it's it's a wonderful life story, a wonderful story of success and triumph and failure and sadness and and love and rediscovery of love, and it's just it's a magnificent story, one of the most beautiful documentaries I've seen all year, and I I highly recommend it to anybody who wants to see this. It's really really beautiful. Uh, and by the way, Carol Spinney is also Oscar. Uh, not as famous for doing Oscar, obviously, because Big Bird is so iconic. But you, you even get into the Big Bird movie, remember? Remember That's the right. Big Bird movie? The Big Bird movie was great. Yeah. Catch That Bird or whatever like, it was. Yeah. 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 It's, it, it's, it's just lovely, Doc. So I Am Big Bird, the Carol Spinney story. That's Carol, one R and two L's, Spinney with two N's. How many J's are in it? Um, See? That's a, a trick question. That's what I'm talking yeah, about. That's, yeah, that's right, what yeah, I mean. See. Anyway, from the good folks at Eclipse, which, of course, is uh, Criterion's... Uh, I uh, like their offshoot line. Not the major films, but they tend to release uh, multi-DVD uh, or Blu-ray sets of uh, major filmmakers doing kind of smaller works. We have Agnes Varda in California. I love Agnes Varda. She's like, I, you know what? Sometimes I think I like Agnes Varda films more than uh, more than some of the other uh, you know French New Wave folks. You know, they're, they're wonderful. I, you know, Cleo from Five to Seven is like my it's favorite. Fantastic. Like it's like my favorite New Wave uh, uh, French New Wave film. It is. You know, Gleaners and I? Come but, on. But because she's not trying too hard. I know. Everybody like, Gadar else, is like... Uh, Gadar is trying so hard you know, to just I, be... They're, they're, they're so aggressive. I mean, my favorite is 400 Blows, but I know what you no, mean. No, 400 Blows, that's like a... You, you, that that was coming from a deeper place. But, like, when I want... I, I hate to say this is going to be, like, blasphemy. Yeah. When I watch, like, Jules and Jim, and he's all <laughs> that voiceover, and they're, I don't know what the hell's going they're on. They're all trying the so just hard. They're trying so hard. She doesn't try hard. No. They're effortless. They just feel organic. I know. They're, they're wonderful. Yeah. Anyway, this is um, this is a uh, multi-DVD set called Agnes Varda in California. Now, Agnes Varda, uh, her career began, began in the 50s, but uh, she spent a bunch of time in the States, specifically uh, California, where she was very much inspired by uh, you know the politics and uh, the culture of the time and the music and whatnot. So she created a bunch of movies. These are mostly in the 60s that uh, took place in California. Uncle Yonko, Black Panthers, um, which is all about Huey Newton, Murmurs, Documentor, and my favorite um, called Lions, Love, and Lies. I like that one a lot. It's a little free form, but it's about this, uh, this, uh, you know, this low-budget filmmaker. She tries, she's trying to make her art film opus. Her, the, the money drops out, so she decides to try to end her life. And uh, it really goes into some crazy freeform documentary fiction, nonfiction areas. That's completely fascinating, especially when you look at um, the new way filmmakers at the time and how they were mixing genres and mixing, you know, and just voiceovers versus uh, the way they use music and the way they use visuals juxtaposed to the to the audio. Which is really experimental stuff back then. And Agnes Varda was, um, to me, one of the least experimental. Like we were saying, where I kind of feel like her movies were probably the straightest narratives as you're going to get in the French New Wave, um, but still interesting. So I would definitely check out Agnes Varda in California. It's got the five films, and uh, it's good stuff. Nice. 
All right, we're going to go into classic movies now. I'm going to uh, talk about some of the, uh, some of the new uh, studio classics line from Kino. Mark will uh, knock out some Warners, and then I'll do some DVD-Rs, and uh, we'll see where that takes us. I, I think we may be able to get to some other stuff. Um, new from the studio classics line uh, through Kino. A bunch of interesting Blu-rays. Stuff, I mean, good stuff, weird stuff, uh, curious stuff. This one is on the curious line. This is from uh, MGM. Uh, and you know, via 20th Century Fox, via Kino, a 1957 creature feature that I have never seen previously called The Monster That Challenged the World. Not the monster that destroyed the world or ate the world or, or, or stomped on the world or invaded the world. The monster that challenged the world. And it's fascinating because the monster arrives in the world and, and says to everyone in humanity, I'll bet you can't eat that hot dog. And the is that earth, what the monster says? Well, yes, and then the and then, it, then everyone eats the hot dog, and then the monster says, "I'll bet you can't uh, pat your stomach and uh, and tap your toe at the same time." Wow! And and every challenge that the monster issues, everyone answers. It's really amazing that we can meet every challenge that is issued us by the monster. Who comes up with a title? The monster that challenged the world. What kind of title is that? It sounds like Corman esque. Challenge like D movie fifties Corman esque. But but challenged. Challenged isn't a, isn't a cinematic it, it, concept. It, it, it's well, it's not very action oriented. It doesn't it's feel ridiculous. Uh, exactly. Anyway, uh, it's 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 a uh, it's a ridiculous creature feature. It's thoroughly insane. It's it's stupid and, and low budget. But um, it's got Hans Conried in it, who which <laughs> counts for something. Uh, you know, he's 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 like kind of a B level star from the era, and why not? Uh, Arthur Gardner directed it. Uh, it's you know, it's a it's a curious creature feature from an area with way too many of them. The January Man, what a weird, eccentric thing this was. For those who don't know, John Patrick Shanley won an Academy Award for uh, Moonstruck. Moonstruck. And then he turned around and he wrote The January Man. which pr- That was horrible. Which promptly, he, it's like, it, it, I don't know why these guys do this. Moonstruck had him suddenly, he was the man. He was the go-to guy. He was on top of everybody's like screenwriter list. And then he did the January Man, and they just crossed his name right off. Yeah, but you know what though? I'm sorry. Joe versus the volcano is funny. It's, it's hilarious. That movie. It's that brilliant. movie. He, he got really crapped on for that movie. He did, but that it's movie's great. funny. Anyway, the January Man stars uh, Kevin Klein uh, along with Susan Sarandon and Harvey Keitel and Rod Steiger and Danny Aiello, and it just it's a great cast. But it just it's just it's just silly. It just makes absolutely no sense, and it's Kevin Klein going way over the top with the persona that he had in Fish Called Wanda, basically doing that same shtick, but to the umph degree. Pat O'Connor, who had a pretty decent uh, career, did Circle of Friends among other, a few other films. I um, reviewed this movie. You realize I re- how, did you well, review well, January when, Man? When was this Man, movie? What a when, mess. When, when did this movie come out? Oh, geez, nine eighty nine. I reviewed it. Yep, 89. that's how long I've been reviewing movies. Wow. I reviewed that movie. It was probably for Entertainment Today. Could have been. Well, anyway, uh, Still of the Night is a lackluster film by Robert Benton, but it's still better than most other films like it. Roy Scheider and Meryl Streep, um, both of them have done much better work, but uh, this is 1982. Robert Benton, uh, you know, just a couple of years after he uh, screamed away all the Oscars with uh, Kramer versus Kramer, returning to work with Meryl Streep again, um, doing what he doesn't do well, which is thrillers. Benton would later sort of right his ship by doing Places in the Heart, uh, after this, so this is kind of a, a little bit of a lull between two really, really good films. But uh, you know what? You could do better with a thriller than Meryl Streep. Uh, you could do worse, I should say, with uh, than with Roy Scheider and Meryl Streep. So it, you know, um, back to the B movie uh, thing. This is a B plus film, War Gods of the Deep. This has been out many times. Uh, this has had some kind of public domain releases, I believe. That were actually, not you know what? Hang on. What? <laughs> What what January man? Are we still going back? You to know January what man? I know because uh, I let it go. Well, I I looked in my uh, computer and actually I reviewed the DVD. So ah. hang on here here's the here's the first here's the first uh, here's the line. You ready? Yeah. This is me writing in uh, when was this written? If it was for the DVD, I'm sure it's probably in the maybe mid nineties or something. Um, unlike most Americans, I remember seeing the January man when it was released in 1989. I remember it like I remember other similar experiences from my younger years, getting hit by a car, my parents' divorce, my appendix rupturing. It's all there, burned onto my memory. The January Man is bad in ways that other bad films can only envy. Well, all right. It, 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 is, it is bad. Look at that. 
So anyway, finishing off War Gods of the Deep, and then I have a bunch of noirs here. War Gods of the Deep looks beautiful. This is uh, from 1965. It was originally in the MGM library, became part of the Orion library, and uh, it's absolutely gorgeous. It's kind of... Um, it's sort of a second tier. Uh, it's in the same. It, it, it sort of wants to be a little bit like vo- like um, um, Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea. Uh, never really uh, attains it, but as far as being this really cool, colorful genre film with a lot of cool underwater stuff, um, and based on an Edgar Allan Poe tale, uh, as many of these Vincent Price things from this era were, um, it you know it, it it found its it found its way. In Nineteen sixty five. It was. You know, that's about the right time for this film. Uh, Vincent Price stars along with Tab Hunter and David Tomlinson, who uh, in 1965 was a big deal because just one year earlier, David Tomlinson had performed the biggest role of his entire career, which was, you know what it was? Do you know what it was? Do you know what it was? I'm still reading my review from... Uh, it was Mr. Banks and Mary Poppins. Oh. So uh, yeah. David Tomlinson, you know, gets a very special billing here because he's bringing the Mary Poppins baggage with him, right? He's a, he's a big star at the time. And uh, then we got four noirs here, four cool noirs from the 1950s. Uh, the first one is uh, Big House USA. Is that a noir title? Come on, Big House USA. That's more of like a women in prison exploitation Isn't that uh, great? title. Broderick Crawford. Yeah. Come on, Broderick Crawford. Charles Bronson, a young Charles Bronson, an older Lon Chaney. These guys are just tough. Uh, anyway, it's about uh, a breakout of ex-cons. And they just, you know, directed by Howard Koch, senior. Um, or if just, I mean, this is this is tough stuff. Really tough guy stuff. Good stuff. Um, you know, ex cons breaking out. Come on, it doesn't get any better than that. If this had been done twenty years earlier, they might have done it with, uh, you know, uh, yes. George Raft and. <laughs> or and twenty years later, they would have done it with Edward G. Robinson and Cagney and all those guys. Uh, Storm Fear. There's another. There's another great noir title. Not, not Storm Cape, Fear. Not Cape Fear. Not Cape Fear. Storm, Storm Fear. Fear. Uh, this is uh, produced and directed by Cornell Wilde, and uh, pretty pretty great. Uh, basically, Cornell Wilde um, also stars in it as a guy who's been wounded after uh, bust after uh, robbing a bank, and. Um, uh, that in turn, you know, he has to sort of hole up in a farmhouse, and uh, then of course, you know, everything kind of moves in on the farmhouse, and it's 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 an interesting little twisty, turny, claustrophobic uh, uh, noir with a lot of a uh, lot of interesting reversals and, and plot machinations. It's pretty sharp, and it's based on a novel, like most of these things are, and the screenplay uh, by all is, of, of all things is by Horton Foote who I never would have expected to write a noir adaptation, but I guess all these guys at some point were basically taking Hollywood gigs. Uh, he Ran All the Way is John Garfield and Shelley Winters. Um, great pairing, uh, directed by John Barry, not to be confused with John Barry, the composer. I'm not that familiar with John Barry as a director, but uh, I'm curious to see a lot of his other stuff because this one is actually pretty sharp. John Gar- maybe, maybe the most interesting thing I've seen John Garfield in other than uh, Postman Always Rings Twice uh, anyway, the, there's a bit of a kind of a psycho vibe here. Uh, John Garfield is, a, is an interesting mama's boy criminal, lives with his mom. And Shelley Winters is just wonderful. She's just, she just gives this bizarre edge to everything that she's in at that era. It's really cool. And the last one, Robert Mitchum, one of the great all-time noir guys, stars in Foreign Intrigue, which is actually based on a TV series. Uh, Sheldon Reynolds created the 1951 series uh, Foreign Intrigue, which was not a big TV series, but uh, he decided to adapt it into a film, and the film apparently better than the uh, better than the TV series works better. So, um, 1956, the uh, 1951 TV series comes to life in uh, in Foreign Intrigue. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, also, uh, Frederick O'Brady, if you've ever seen Mr. Arcaden, he's uh, he's in this as well. All right, Mark. What do we got, Wade? We got uh, a couple uh, things from the good folks over at uh, Warren Airs. You like that, Warren Airs? I do. I know you do. I like, that one. I like that one that you're holding. This one, my... No, not that one. That's the one I love. <laughs> this one? No. Take that one. No. I talked about this one. Yes. Uh, Wade, let me tell you something. 87, there was a movie that uh, really was um, really uh, hit a chord. People, uh, people enjoyed it. It was nice, nice, fun, middle of the road, wacky, funny, energetic entertainment called Inner Space. 1987. Joe Dante. We talked about Joe Dante last week, we didn't sure we? We sure did. 
this, how far he's fallen. I know. This stars uh, Meg Ryan and Dennis Quaid. Dennis Quaid plays a, a Navy test pilot who um, is part of this top-secret miniature, miniaturization experiment. He winds up accidentally injected into the body of Martin Short. Now, if you don't know who Martin Short is... He goes, well, hey, he's one of the three amigos. He's a wacky, crazy, physical comedian, very Steve Martin-esque. I saw Martin, believe it or not, I saw Martin Short and Jason Alexander in the L.A. production of The Producers. Lame. <laughs> it, wasn't, it wasn't bad. It wasn't bad. It was opening night, and Jason Alexander was losing his voice and really straining. He must have popped a vocal cord or two just to keep hitting, hitting all the songs. And uh, Martin Short, actually, at one point, because he knows he can't really do Matthew Broderick or Gene Wilder, so he started. He started going into what was his, his SCTV personality? The, oh, uh, uh, the, the 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 guy with the Grimly, not the, Grimly. The, yes, he starts doing the Grimly dance at certain points, and the audience was like, "What are you doing? That's not this character. Stop Terrible. it! Stop it!" Terrible. This is the P- Pantages. Anyway, carry on. He he used to show, when I was on the Roseanne talk show. He was on his show, Martin Short show, another daytime talk show was also at CBS. We we shared a floor. <laughs> you know. <laughs> We've been behind him in the market many times. Once was for was buying uh, was the day before Thanksgiving, and uh, I think I think my, my wife might have even done a very funny Facebook post because we he, it's like he bought a he buys a ton of food for holidays. Like Martin Short must throw one hell of a banquet on holidays. I've seen him buying Christmas dinner stuff. I've seen him buying Thanksgiving, and I mean he spends like ridiculous amounts of money on just an enormous amount of food. He must just haul all of his friends and everybody over and just throw the mother of all. Sp- Spreads. I would love to be at his house. He, he seems like a guy who would have a good time at a party. Yeah. Seems like yeah. there's probably a piano somewhere oh, in sure. the house. I'm sure. And then show tunes will be sang at. I'm sure. Anyway, will be carry sung. On. Martin Short, at Dennis Quaid, Marty Space. Love thing. this movie. Yes, it's a fun, it's a fun movie. Look, th- this is back in the day when you had like Honey I Shrunk the Kids and a whole bunch of these like kind of middle of the road but fun, pleasant, energetic, not dumbed down, kind of middle of the road comedies, and a lot of them were fun. And Inner Space was one of them. And uh, it was one of Joe Dante's last films that you cared about. Yeah, you know, it's a it's a say. great little it's a great little homage. It also won an Oscar, by the way. See, this thing won a visual f- a visual effects Oscar. It was you know, it, as did uh, Fantastic Voyage, the Fleischer film, which it kind of pays homage to. You know, which is the other miniaturization in the blood movie. But you know who else is in this movie? Is Vernon Wells. Vernon Wells. Vernon Wells is the is the bad guy in this movie. And then anybody watches this and they go, "Gosh, that guy that he's so menacing. He looks familiar." It's because he's the bad guy in the in the Road Warrior as well with the mohawk. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Love Vernon Wells. Fun stuff. Fun fantasy adventure. Definitely a good time. Good time. Next we have uh, another uh, movie that uh, this is from the early 90s that uh, struck a chord. It's called Free Willy. <laughs> they, they had like three there was there was like there was like three or four or six sequels to Too this many. damn thing. And what, why would they name it this? It was so ripe for jokes. Everybody <laughs> just—I mean, this was like th- this. Uh, come on, it's about seriously. a boy and his whale. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's his kid. This kid, he's twelve years old. He's going through a rough period. He's just moved into a foster home, so he winds up acting out by spraying graffiti all over this adventure park that's near his home. And then his punishment, he has to clean the graffiti off the adventure park that's near his home, and he winds up befriending this whale who's at the adventure park. Hanging out, smoking dope. Hanging out, smoking. The two of them are smoking dope together, <laughs> drinking beers. Hey, kid, you got a light? Exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it also co- co-stars Lori Petty from A League of Their Own. She's in this thing, too. You know, I thought the scenes with the whale were very cute. Again, it, it definitely uh, struck a chord at the time. They made a bunch of sequels. The sequels were increasingly more ridiculous. This one, the original, it's very gentle, very sweet, very appealing. It's fine for the kids. Uh, Free Willy. I mean, come on. So there you go. Can't beat Free Willy. Uh, the last of the bunch, which is to say also the least of the bunch, is a movie called uh, Blast from the Past from 1999 about a um, scientist and his wife, and they move into a bomb shelter because they think World War III is about to start. And uh, it's with Brendan Fraser and um, Christopher Walken and Alicia Silverstone. And I guess, you know what? It was directed by Hugh Wilson for some reason. Like Hugh Wilson's right. a weird guy to direct that. You movie. know, he created he created WKRP and then he went and he did the Police uh, Academy, Academy series, right. and he just, I mean, he's a talented guy. He just, he's just well, look, he's first all over wives the club, first wives club. I know. That he's was all over that the was map. Kind of, uh, first wives club is probably his his only real movie. Yeah, you know. Um, anyway, so people seem to like Blast from the past. I, I think it's I think it's it's really not funny. I was never a huge fan of Brendan Fraser, although he guy keeps getting work. Actually, you know, Brendan Fraser starred in an Oscar winning Best Picture. 
Did he? Oh, of course he did. Yes, that's right. Crash. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. Brendan Fraser. Yeah. Put that out there. Brendan Fraser no, starred no. in an Oscar-winning Best uh-huh. Picture. Yep. Well, I mean, he didn't. He was. A, it, it was an ensemble. Let's not make it sound like it's a Brendan Fraser movie. Uh, and he's really good in it, you know. You he's love that it. movie. I do. I hate that movie. I do. I know everybody else does, but I, I called it. You were in the room. Everybody's like, "Oh, it's going to be Brokeback Mountain." I was like, "Nope." And the winner is Crash. Because the you, is Crash. Yeah, yeah. Because all the actors would. All the actors went for Crash. Of course. That's when that was when SAG started flexing its muscle, and the SAG Awards became the barometer. So uh, let me go. Th- I'm going to go through some uh, DVD R's real quickly from uh, from Fox and from Warner Brothers. Uh, Fox has three westerns, and then this thing, The Games, which is from uh, 1969. Oh, such weird movies between 1969 and 71. It's a weird era. Uh, anyway, The Games takes place at the uh, 1960 Rome Olympics and uh, basically deals with, the, with a bunch of marathon contestants. Um, it's, it's surprisingly well done, actually, directed by Michael Winner, who had that moment, right? He just... Death Wish. I mean, he did Death Wish. He had that moment from about 1968 to about 1974. And that sort of really... Old, I mean, it was like six or seven very productive years, and he did some really interesting work. And this is a uh, fascinating, you know, totally dated score by Francis Lai, which has that whole kind of groovy 60s, you know, love and... And, uh, and, and wispiness to it. But um, otherwise, it, it, this is totally competent. Eric Segal, who was a good screenplay r- uh, writer at the time, uh, adapts the Hugh Atkinson novel. And, uh, you know, I don't want to say it feels like um, Grand Prix on foot, but it kind of does. It feels like Grand Prix with, with runners. So uh, it's called The Games and uh, from 1969. The Westerns, or the quasi-Westerns, begins with When the Legends Die, which was made in 1972. Uh, based on the Hal Borland novel and uh, directed by Stuart Millar. Essentially a story of a guy, a a Native American, played by Frederick Forrest, who uh, winds up being a horse wrangler at a rodeo working for a uh, rather nasty figure uh, played by Richard Widmark. A decent drama, not not a brilliant film. Um, and then we've got an interesting movie called Kid Blue, which is uh, stars Dennis Hopper. This was made in 1973 when Hopper was sort of all the rage. Um, Hopper is this guy who's trying to overcome his life as an outlaw, and they just keep dragging him back in. Warren Oates, Ben Johnson, really, really good cast. Uh, directed by James Frawley, who also had a bit of a moment. Uh, the Culpepper Cattle Company... Uh, is actually quite good. Uh, I'd seen this before, and it's better than I remember. This is also from 1972, directed by Dick Richards, who had next to no career, and uh, stars Gary Grimes and uh, Louis Skew and Bo Hopkins and uh, Jeffrey Lewis. Jeffrey Lewis, you know, another... All these are kind of workmanlike guys, journeymen. Um, but it's essentially a, about a, um, a, a cattle drive and this 16-year-old kid who is struggling to sort of keep up with all the other guys who are running the cattle drive. And it's, it's, a, it's quite, a, quite a thing staging the cattle drive. Um, you know, it, you, the horses and the cows don't exactly take direction very well, you know. Stupid cows. Stupid cows. And then a couple from the Warner Archive collection here. Uh, Run of the Arrow with Rod Steiger and Brian Keith. Uh, also with uh, Charles Bronson in a, uh, in a small part. This is one of those just legendary Samuel Fuller movies. It's got an amazing score by Victor Young, uh, and it's just, it's just classic Samuel Fuller, you know? It, it's, uh, it's a Western. Um, it takes place right after the Civil War, and yet even though it's one of those Westerns, from that era, from the late 50s, and in, in, in you can sort of include the early 60s in this period, it just feels like a Sam Fuller film. It's just a little bit raw, and it's a little bit crazy, and it's a little bit uh, over the edge, and you can tell that this is just not one of, you know, this is not a normal man directing this movie. This is a crazy guy. Uh, so anyway, it's, uh, it's definitely worth checking out, and it's one of, um, one of Rod Steiger's more interesting, uh, one of his more interesting uh, roles, and one of the films that's actually not quite, you know, you look at Native Americans as they're depicted in a lot of films from this era, and it just, it's just like, wow, dress up, why, why don't you put body paint in a bunch of white people and have them just do horrible stereotypes? But this one is a little bit more gritty and more realistic. And then lastly here is Jose Ferrer and the High Cost of Loving, uh, co-starring Jenna Rollins, and uh, this is lovely. Uh, totally forgotten film in many respects, directed by Jose Ferrer, and uh, really pretty, pretty, pretty solid. And I'm surprised that he didn't actually do many more films after this because it is 
This is almost one of the most timely films I've seen in a long time. Uh, this was actually originally released in 1958, and it's basically about a guy who is uh, about to lose his job in this g- corporate downsizing. And um, there's kind of a Sweet Smell of Success vibe to this, in a, in a way. Uh, Bad and the Beautiful, uh, all those kinds of films. It's, uh, it feels like it, it sort of belongs in that, uh, in that same vein. It's funnier, it's more satirical, um, not quite as dark, but man, it's, uh, it's, it's, awfully, it's awfully smart and it's awfully well written. Um, interesting story by uh, Rip Van Ronkel and Milo O'Frank Jr. Uh, screenplay by Rip Van Ronkel. I, I have to wonder if Rip Van Ronkel isn't a uh, isn't some kind of an interesting pseudonym. Anyway, great great supporting cast that includes uh, future very familiar people, including Jim Backus and Werner Klemperer, who would become sitcom legends in uh, in the not too distant future. So uh, wonderful movie, high cost of loving. Wait, uh, not a wonderful movie, but an interesting movie uh, from Wes Craven, who you know, of course, from Scream and Nightmare on Elm Street, is a little ditty called The People Under the Stairs. Now, a lot of uh, Wes Craven stuff, maybe not enough of it, but a lot of Wes Craven stuff had a little bit of political messaging kind of uh, buried deep, deep in there. And here, with The People Under the Stairs, you get some... Now, again, this is like 1991, so this is Reagan-era stuff, so you get kind of that you know, post-Reagan-era messaging about, uh, you know, what we would soon go on to call the 99% versus the 1%, because um, here the um, the protagonist is a 13-year-old African-American boy, and he stumbles upon this home, and there's a mysterious couple living in the home, and the, the you know, kids who live under the stairs. So it's all very horrifying and uh, terrifying and whatnot. Um, I think this is one of Wes Craven's more middling Efforts. It is not like Scream, which reinvented a whole genre, or Nightmare on Elm Street, which was kind of a classic of its low-budget time. This is kind of somewhere in the middle. But uh, So if you're a Wes Craven completist, you may want to check it out. There's an audio commentary here with Wes Craven and a second one with a couple of the stars, including um, A.J. Langer. And, uh, yeah, a couple of uh, featurettes. So People Under the Stairs, uh, is it good? It's okay. You know, it's got, a, it's got a, a, an interesting little schmear of uh, social pretense going on there. But... Um, I, the only thing is that it's not that terrifying. It's more bizarre and unintentionally funny than it is terrifying. But uh, still, you know what? Uh, People under the stairs. It definitely had its moment in 1991. You know, Matt is supposed to be doing a remake of. Uh, no, no, it's not a remake of this. It's a remake of uh, They Live. Why That's would Matt do that? Never mind. I take it back. Uh, for some reason, I thought he was doing a remake of this, but then I remembered it was uh, it was it was They Live, which Rowdy Piper, right? I know. Jeez, man. That's Roddy wild. Piper. Sad, speaking of. Anyway, uh, a couple of Criterions this week. Really good ones, both. Um, Blu-ray releases of uh, The French Lieutenant's Woman and Night and Night in the City by Jules Dassin. The French Lieutenant's Woman uh, by Carol Rice is uh, one of Meryl Streep's very best performances. This is when she was just in the zone. Uh, in 1981, she'd you know, won her... Uh, she w- she was between Oscars, right? She was you know pre Sophie's Choice. She's won so many, she's technically always between yeah, Oscars. Yeah, she is. Oh, man. What a gifted woman. Anyway, French Lieutenant's Woman, just absolutely beautiful. Uh, co-starring Jeremy Irons right when he was becoming a big deal. Um, it's such an amazing, I mean, just fantastic. The, the you know, script by uh, Harold Pinter. Um, I just, it, it's such a beautiful period recreation. Uh, shot by Freddie Francis. I mean, it's just so wonderful. The score, everything about this is just so lush. I, I wish there were more movies like this. Um, and I can't believe it's 1981. It's been 34 years since this movie was released. It's incredible. Um, tons of extras. Fantastic uh, restoration here, along with new interviews by, uh, with, with both Jeremy Irons and Meryl Streep, along with the editor and Carl Davis, the legendary composer who wrote the score. Uh, new interview with uh, film scholar uh, Ian Christie about the film and an episode of The South Bank Show from 1981 with Carol Rice and John Fowles, who wrote the novel, and, of course, Harold Pinter. Um, speaking of The South Bank Show, why don't they release, and this is a rhetorical question because I know you have no clue what I'm talking about, why don't they release more episodes of The South Bank Show? Oh, I love The South Bank See, Show. No wow. Because The South Bank Show is an amazing British oh, interview show. It's I the mean, greatest. Some of the man. episodes are great. There's one so with David good. Lean and Robert Bolt, which I would, be, I would kill to have. On oh, DVD. kill! I've got it on VHS. I wouldn't. I, I would maim. I know you would. I wouldn't kill. I'd maim for that show. And wow! Jules Dassin's Night in the City. What? Look at the great artwork they got for this. 
this really cool, pugnacious 1950-era uh, artwork. It's really great. Uh, Richard Widmark basically plays this, uh, this, this wrestling hustler, and, uh, which I think is probably where a lot of the wrestling stuff in uh, Barton Fink originally came from, probably inspired by this. Um, but anyway, this is, uh, this is actually this is fascinating because the, Jules Dassin was um, uh, on the verge of being blacklisted at the time, and so they, uh, they shot this in London, um, and uh, you would never, you know, you'd never know. I mean, London, obviously, a great place you can to shoot, but this is just great film noir, really, really tough, uh, tough stuff, and one of Jules Dassin's best films, and uh, beautiful screenplay by Joe Isinger, who really didn't do anything else of, of great significance, but sure did with this one. Uh, wonderful extras here, including a commentary from the original 2005 release of this by uh, Glenn Erickson. You get a 2005 uh, Jules Dassin interview, as well as a 1972 interview, and then a comparison between the uh, British and American scores for the film, which were different. So uh, it's just great. You, you get the complete 101-minute uh, British version of the film and uh, the 95-minute American version of the film, and it is, uh, it is fantastic. Uh, it just doesn't get better. Yep, I'm a big fan of Jules yep. Dassin. Yep. I loved uh, Rafifi and, of course, uh, The Naked City, which really used New York as a backdrop. Yeah. New York almost a character in the film, yeah. almost like a documentary. And also, by the way, a, a bit of a return to form for him was uh, Top Cappy, yeah. where he tried to kind of... Uh, Peter he, Ustinov won an Oscar for that. He tried to kind of uh, uh, take that Rafifi thing and make, a, make the, uh, the heist in Top Cappy even yeah. bigger, you know. But in the end, Rafifi was the classic. Good stuff. Yep. Uh, what also good stuff is an interesting film from the good folks at Arrow, Cemetery Without Crosses. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking Cemetery... Without crosses, what's that? It's very Sergio Leone esque. In fact, uh, if I remember this correctly, uh, having just seen it, uh, it was dedicated to Sergio Leone. So either they did that as a nod to Sergio or they did that to justify ripping off Sergio. I'm not sure which one, but um, either way, this is a terrific tale of revenge. And, uh, you know, if, if you're a fan of this kind of genre, you gotta love it. Opens with a really intense lynching. Um, this woman's husband is lynched by a rival, uh, rival rancher. And she wants revenge. So in enters this guy named Manuel, and he learns of the hanging, and he is going to uh, get revenge by kidnapping the rival rancher's grown daughter. And I won't tell you anything more, because even though this film is kind of forgotten and it isn't really the most popular of this sort of film, I do think it's an interesting genre blend. It's got a little bit of giallo in it, a little bit of, uh, a little bit of Sergio Leone in it. I just think it's an interesting little kind of a curio. So I would definitely check out Cemetery Without Crosses if you're a fan of Sergio Leone and uh, that kind of cinema. All righty. And let's, uh, let's wrap things out with just a few TV titles. Uh, the Dove Keepers, uh, not something that I, I would uh, recommend anybody run out really quickly. To, are you okay? Hi, Wade. You, okay? you dropped the mic. I dropped then. the mic on my pot belly. That's all right. That's okay. It, as long as it's not a... Uh, a kettle belly. My 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 belly is quite uh, is quite uh, uh, padded now thanks yeah. to the uh, red velvet cake from last week and the brownie nice. from this week. Well, good for you. I'm glad I don't. And I'm having dim sum for dinner tonight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good for you. You don't like dim sum? Not really. I had a bad dim sum experience in Hong Kong. I they brought the little dim sum tray cart a lot around, and I thought, well, there's something that I recognize. That looks really good, because we were th we were there. It was a, it was 1997, just coming back from the Cannes Film Festival, and uh, doing a little round the world deal. And uh, you know, I had just been eating my share of uh, of citrus tarts in France, and this cart comes along, and I look at it, and I go, that's a citrus tart, just like in France, and I'm going to eat that. Little did I, of course, I didn't stop to think. Why would an, why would Hong Kong be making citrus tarts for dim sum? Why would that make sense here? It looked like a citrus tart. I bit right into it and right into raw egg. Well, that's never not, again. That's not the tart's fault. That I it don't was not care. what you thought it was going to be. It was disgusting, and I will never have dim sum again. Just saying. Anyway, you got your mind. The Dove Keepers on Blu-ray. Uh, this was recently on CBS. And uh, it is a. This is an attempt to sort of capitalize on all of the Bible miniseries and the religious miniseries that have been sort of doing pretty good. From uh, you know, uh, uh, what's his name, the game show guy and his wife, Chuck Paris. No, 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 no. The the, the Bible. Uh, the, the, oh the, yeah, the, the Mark uh, Burnett. Yeah, Mark Burnett, and, and uh, yeah. 
Uh, the, so one, anyway. the, one, the one where, where they cast Obama as the devil? Yes. Is exactly. that one? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this is uh, based on a novel, actually, by Alice Hoffman, and it's essentially about the, um, the, the you know, Masala was a great miniseries years ago with Peter Strauss. Sure. This is about the event of Masala, but through the eyes of, of a number of women who are journeying there uh, at around the same time. It's a little soapy, but it's it's okay. It's decently done. Uh, and this is, of course, also produced by uh, Mark Burnett and Roma Downey. So it is, you know, it's it's an ongoing thing with them, and uh, they're turning it into a little cottage industry. And then uh, B. Arthur in Maud, complete second season, spinoff from All in the Family. Terrific. B. Arthur, never better. Even even on the Golden Girls, she wasn't this good. Uh, this is 24 episodes from the second season, no extras. Uh, but Shout Factory gives us uh, that complete uh, great season, which includes some great guest stars by, you know, like Adrian Barbeau and Conrad Bain before he went on to different strokes. And uh, her future Golden Girls uh, cast member, Rue McClanahan. So there you go. Oh, I love Maud. It's a great show. It, it was groundbreaking for the time. It was, totally. The thing is that we can't... We can't jolt people no, the same today way like we could then. Well, you can, but the way you would jolt them would, would incur the wrath of like 97 special interest groups that would just jump down your throat and you'd be canceled the next day. <laughs> that's, wh that's what would happen. That's true. Yeah. So anyway. Wait. Uh, oh, oh, what? Oh, what? 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 Are you, uh, are you doing fire. that? Yes. Go ahead. No, oh. Go ahead. Uh, wait. On the USA Network, there's a show called Dig, and uh, Dig was uh, launched with great fanfare. Uh, too bad it's uh, terrible. <laughs> so it was it was launched as a 10 episode thing limited series i guess but obviously they would prefer that it had gone on to greater success uh but it has not i uh i don't know that this thing is getting picked up for a second season either way it stars uh jason isaacs he's an fbi agent and he's working in the american embassy in jerusalem and uh, his college-age daughter has died, and one he meets this mysterious woman who shows him this big archaeological e e excavation that might have the incredible historic importance, which I will not tell you because, um, well, not that you'll ever see it. But um, it's just not that exciting. I, I, you know what? It's, 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 it sort of goes to that Da Vinci Code thing where it's like, you know, these these little discoveries wind up having these, like, ripples through the centuries as history becomes comes to life and has you know it, it's just it's just not that it's just not that good however i love ann Haish. i have to say i do have a thing for ann Haish. i think she's a terrific actor who's never really gotten the career that she deserved maybe because she was a bit of a freak uh she about 15 years to, ago she's a little tough to work with tough to she, work with and yeah. she had that weird like oh i'm a lesbian thing but then i'm not a lesbian i'm not sure yet <laughs> well, i've changed my mind i was i think i think i think the the issue with that was that people felt like she was doing a lot of things for the sake of publicity that she was sort of uh trying to trying to ride the tabloids and that doesn't necessarily bode well for people who want to be taken seriously as actors but still uh you know cinemax has this uh show called the nick uh, produced by Steven Soderbergh. Uh, the first season of it with Clive Owen is now out, and uh, it's pretty it's pretty interesting. Um, not not great. Uh, I think it's got a got a few rough edges that they could kind of hone out. But it takes place turn of the century at the Knickerbocker Hospital, which is hence the title. Um, and it's uh, you know it's sort of I guess. I don't want to call every period film uh, like Downton Abbey, but the Downton Abbey has pioneered of late these shows that use certain historical periods as a significant backdrop to make contemporary commentary. And this is kind of doing uh, something a little bit similar. Uh, wonderful cast here. Clive Owen is, uh, you know, this, this whole, um, the struggle to keep this hospital afloat, much like Downton Abbey is trying to keep the estate afloat. That's sort of the, the essence of this. But it is, uh, it is well shot. It is really well acted. Some uh, great cast members. And Clive Owen, you just can't get a, a heavier, heavyweight guy to anchor this thing. So uh, that's a sharp show. And then, uh, well, go ahead. Finish that up. Another uh, sharp show is Scandal. Scandal is uh, part of the uh, Shonda Rhimes empire that we talked about last week. This is um, season four. And I have to say that at this point, I, I, I'm, I'm star I'm star I checked out a little bit this season because I feel like it's getting a little bit too ridiculously pulpy. It, it's, it's not that it's jumping the shark, but it's, um, it's, it's getting, on the, it's, motor it's, it's getting yeah. on the motorcycle that will rev up and then the shark will be jumping. Yeah, I, I hear you. Because you know it's like, uh, uh, what's her name? Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I got her name right. 
Kerry Washington. Yes. You know, she's uh, she's out of Washington, then the president gets reelected, and now she's back in Washington, and this guy dies, and then it's, it's all this stuff going on. And I feel like it's getting a little pulpy to my taste. I felt that the couple of, first couple of seasons had a lot more um, inspiration, seemed a little more realistic, um, not a soap opera but people love it. And again, like I said last week, you got to hand it to Shonda Rhimes. She's... Uh, really created these great shows that resonate with that audience and she doesn't phone them in you know they're good shows they're popular shows so uh you know good for her so scandal season four again it's starting to fall apart a little bit for me but still also amc's hell on wheels which is a bit of a uh, overlooked show i do like this show mainly because i like that time in history this is all about the uh making of the continental railroad and here we have the complete fourth season and what I liked about this season is that they came up with a very clever way to kind of get you more invested in the characters, which is it's the late 1860s, and uh, it was a very brutal winter, so they stopped working on the railroad. So if they stopped working on the railroad, all these Western guys, they have nothing to do. So they get into trouble, they, they you know, sex, and, and, and a, lot of, a lot of alcohol, a lot of fights. A lot, you know, so it's a very clever way to get them not just working on the railroad, but sort of like you put them in closed quarters where you get to learn a lot more about them. Um, through this brutal winter. So I kind of like that idea and uh, also like uh, Call Me, which is cool. All right. I like the show. Hell on Wheels. AMC. Bravo. That's it. See you guys next week.